Prime Minister Julia Gillard is set to embark on a week-long tour of North Asia this week, taking in Japan, South Korea and China. Her visit to China comes at a time when the regime is cracking down on perceived dissidents in the wake of the popular uprisings and ongoing protests in the Middle East. Chinese Christians are among the latest to be targeted, along with dozens of activists, writers and human rights lawyers, including internationally known artist Ai Weiwei. To discuss developments in China, we're joined from London by China watcher Will Hutton. Will Hutton was editor-in-chief of The Observer for four years and still writes a weekly column for the paper. He's a governor of the London School of Economics and is the author of several books, including The Writing on the Wall, China and the West in the 21st Century. Will Hutton, welcome to Late Line. Hi, good evening. Can you ever see a so-called jasmine revolution in China and perhaps the even bigger question, one that could prove unstoppable? Yes, I mean, I think, <clears throat> I think one day um, uh, we will all wake up with as much surprise as we woke up to the Arab Spring, and there will be uh, in China what we witnessed in North Africa. Um, uh, 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 you know, whether we may have to wait, uh, you know, uh, ten years for it, it may happen in the next six months. I mean, the, and the party is plainly paranoid about this. Uh, uh, that is the. Uh, you know, that's, the explanation for this extraordinary crackdown that actually started about 18 months ago and has been intensifying ever since. And, you know, Ai Weiwei, that's a, that's, that's a, that's a, that's a big one. Um, but as you said in your introduction, I mean, it's, it's, it's widespread, this. And, what's, and, and the worst thing is in Chongqing, uh, the, the kind of governor there, Mr. Bo, who's going to be kind of Maoist and uh, really having a, a, a complete uh, crackdown in one way, in a good way um, on corruption, but the bad way is that it's completely kind of doesn't respect any attempt um, at rule of law. I mean, it is the nearest thing we've had to kind of Maoist type crackdown in China uh, for 20 years. And Mr. Xi, um, who's going to take over China, it's expected. Um, um, as Prime Minister, um, was there just recently you know, saying how much she approved of Mr. Bo's actions. I mean, this is qu quite a moment, actually, in time. Yeah, well, you say quite a moment. I mean, it, it, over the recent years, I suppose, it sort of waxed and waned. At one point, it seems that the regime is slightly loosening its grip ever so slightly, and then it tightens up again. You think this is something quite different to what you could almost call the normal cycle? Um, no one should forget that Tiananmen, um, which is now over 20 years ago, didn't just happen in Tiananmen in, in, uh, in Beijing. I mean, there were really widespread revolts in, uh, in close to 200 Chinese cities. And uh, it, it took two years before the Chinese began to get confident again in proceeding with the kind of progress, what they call a socialist market economy, and uh, talk to anybody in China from the kind of Politburo party school down. I mean, they're aware. They sit on a kind of social volcano. I mean, there is so much perceived unfairness by, um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the villages of uh, um, just you know, totalitarian view and arbitrary judgments and confiscation of land and not proper compensation paid. There's the whole migrant labor force which are, um, in, the, in the towns that's kind of restlessly sitting there from the country illegally and could be moved back at any time. There's a middle class growing who want to know um, what's happening um, to their tax remimbi. You know, all of it is a kind of in fervent. Uh, in, and, there's, and the ideology of the Communist Party to control of this is completely bankrupt. That's the big thing. Nobody believes in communism in China. And so, you know, in this, this is this is just uh, a, a, it's a it's a tinderbox. You know, it, you, nobody can tell what um, flash, what will the fl the flashpoint be. No one can tell whether it will come from below. No one can tell whether it will come from you know one of the coastal cities or in the interior. No one can tell whether it will come from the middle class. But, but it could is it, even is it, come. It, sorry, I was going to say, could it could it not come though if there is not continued economic growth? I mean, is that one of the reasons that this country, which is now still growing at over nine percent and now has a big inflation problem, but the government knows that if it can't provide jobs, prosperity, and opportunity, then any sense of any legitimacy is gone. Absolutely. I mean, they've. I mean, uh, <coughs> um, Deng Xiaoping said this before he died. Actually, his famous Southern Tour. He says, "But look, the only sources of legitimacy we have are." 
is a growth and b the fact the party um, is going to project um you know china abroad and and you know end the humiliations that we suffer from the foreigner and that broadly explains what Chinese have, the Chinese have done the last 20 years, and I think it currently explains them. And here we are, you know, with inflation at 5%. The money supply is growing at over 15%. And inflation is one of the really toxic things in China because the savings rate is so high. Peasants just watch their – excuse me. Peasants just see their, you know, and their, the, the cash, which they often hoard under the bed, actually, just, you know, collapse in value if you get inflation going much above. Once inflation goes above 10 percent, it really becomes quite a s serious problem. It was one of the triggers, actually, to Tiananmen. And now the Chinese are trying to kind of rein in um, this money supply growth with some qualitative controls. Oh, here's a factor. And I was astonished when I learned that foreign exchange reserves in China have just been announced, actually, at the end of March, $3 trillion. They're up $600 billion in 12 months. Now, there's an iron rule in economics. You know, what's unsustainable can't be sustained. The Chinese cannot carry on acquiring foreign exchange reserves like this. It's a massive distortion. You know, this is all about to blow. And if you're in Australia, beware. Well, what indeed, you've long argued that the, the Chinese economy is a bubble that, that is ready to pop. But why can't China, I suppose, follow the growth or the development paths of, say, South Korea or, or Japan, where as the economy matures, growth starts to slow down? Why is it sort of built on such tenuous uh, foundations, as you would put it? Well, it doesn't matter whether it's a, the... Uh I mean, just think of just think of banking alone. I mean, the great thing about banking in South Korea or in Japan that there is a rule of law. If a bank wants to um, get interest paid or re money repaid or foreclose on a creditor, it can because there's a whole structure in which it can do that. That can't happen in China. There's just no rule of law. And when you get an economy to a level of sophistication, and the Chinese are there or thereabouts. Uh, you know, this is a $5 trillion economy. It's not a non trivially sized economy. And the complexity of it and the need to innovate in order to get genuine productivity increases in an indigenous Chinese way are, you know, what is the big problem now confronting, confronting the, the economy? To get to the next level, that they have to build these kinds of institutions. But as soon as they do that, they challenge the uh, unilateral authoritarian rule of the party. And that is the $64,000 question facing the Chinese leadership and has faced them for um, all of this decade. Now, they've managed to kind of get through. But I'm, my, my view is, is that the transition to, uh, to the next generation that's going to happen next year I mean, is as delicate as the transition um, to Gorbachev um, in 1980 in, in the Soviet Union. And, I, and this is, you know, we're now five generations away from the revolutionary leadership. We were five generations away when Gorbachev took over. When you get five generations away from the revolutionary moment in a, in a, in a communist society like Cuba, where it's also happening, like um, China, like um, the Soviet Union, it becomes a real problem of legitimacy for the regime. It, well, it, indeed, you, you make this argument, and it, the country's current vice president, uh, Xi Jinping, who's due to take over next year, is there anything about him, is there anything about this fifth generation in China that makes you think that they could be, uh, I guess, a catalyst, or are you more thinking that they will just simply be the last, they will be run out of town? Well, I mean, um, I often make these arguments or have made these arguments now for a couple of years. You know, these things are, you know, these things don't happen overnight. This is, going to, this is, this is a story that's going to take three, four, five years. And actually, finally, when, when, you know, authoritative people can, who kind of really close to the Chinese leadership hear me, they always say, well, you know, I kind of almost underestimate the scale of problems facing China. But they make the point, and this is the key thing, they make the point that they understand the problems um, as obviously better, a thousand times better than I do. And, that, and, they, draw, and they make this, um, they, they draw this distinction to say, we are a coherent elite that run China. Uh, we understand our problems, and when, if you have coherent elites, and by the way, you used to have a coherent elite in the United Kingdom and the United States, you don't have any longer. That's why your countries are in, are in trouble. We are coherent. Now, I'm not sure that's true, you see. I'm not sure that the Chinese, A, do have a coherent elite, and B, um, even if they were coherent, they can actually manage the scale of the problems that are confronting them. Um, and I think that's going to be, and um, your question is well put, 
I think all that's going to be kind of highlighted um, as we have this kind of change in the leadership, which is taking place next year. I, I, and we only just managed it in an orderly way 10 years ago. Can it be done in an orderly way this time round? There are huge tensions between various factions in the party. We'll see. Well, th there may be huge tensions, but at the same time, this is a country with a massive security apparatus. It's proved incredibly effective at shutting down the Internet, at blocking access to information. Yeah. I, I, I just wonder, I mean, I even the, the small calls for Jasmine Revolution that we've seen on the Internet, the small attempts at protest, they have been crushed almost instantaneously. I mean, w when you look at that environment, whether or not the leadership is united, do you not think that it's some way away before a popular uprising could really take hold? Look, I, I mean, this could come from above, it could come from below, or it could just be provoked by, you know, um, a first order economic crisis that no one is, ex is expecting. I mean, the, 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 the Chinese financial system is many times more fragile um, than the American and British and Western banking system was in the run-up to the financial crash in 2008. I mean, I mean it, <coughs> it's lent many times more than Chinese GDP now. Um, many of those loans, there's no interest paid or principal ever repaid. I mean, uh, this is an accident waiting to happen. You get any kind of economic downturn in China, and you could get major institutional failures. And then, actually, you know, in in that that could be um, the 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 trigger to upheaval and change. As you said earlier, as long as the economy is growing at eight, nine, ten percent um, per annum, as long as it's generating jobs and doing it with inflation which is below five percent, um, that is actually an important source of stability. It's just, if anything happens to that, that actually I think will be the trigger to change. Well, given the challenges that this uh, the government in in Beijing faces, uh, given the crackdown, what sort of an environment do you think the Australian Prime Minister? will be walking into when she arrives next week. It's the first visit by an Australian PM for over two and a half years, despite the strength of the economic relationship. Well, um, uh, I mean, they are very, very uh, self-confident at the moment, the Chinese. I always think that pride comes before a fall, but um, the Chinese are very self-confident. They really believe that it's the Chinese century. They really believe they, despite the problems, they can handle them. And they really think that they're, they're emerging as Asia's top dog. And they will be understanding the visit of the Australian Prime Minister as, um, not quite in these terms, but nearly a form of tribute being paid by uh, a, a client state. I mean, that's very much how they've always visualized the relationship with their neighbors. And so they'll be, they'll be thinking of it in those terms. They'll be, I mean, they're very they are anxious to secure um, their um, raw materials, and that's always been the, the ace card that Australia has to play. And I'm sure that's what Julie Gillard will be talking about with her team. Um, and you, and, and uh, I, I think she, well, I mean, my advice from London, uh, I mean, as far as she, she can ignore it, and, um, but, but my view is at least that actually she, she really has to put her marker down that actually. Um, uh, Australia is watching this crackdown. Um, it's unhappy about it. And also, I think that you know, medium to long term success in China's own terms means not doing this kind of thing. They actually, they have to find a way through that. Because indeed, it's it is their it's, self interest. It's the ultimate irony, isn't it? Change. You talk about the confidence of China, and yet, as uh, Ai Weiwei wrote himself, that they're fragile enough to believe one dissenting voice could bring down the mighty force. And you see that over and over again the targeting of the individual, despite the strength of it, China. It's, a, it, it's, a, it's, such a, it's such a country of ambiguities and contradictions. It's an elephant, a huge economic giant. It's extraordinarily poor in terms of per capita income, uh, you know, especially in the uh, especially in the east. And then you have, you know, this other contradiction: huge boastfulness and self-assurance abroad, paranoia at home. You know, it is very difficult to navigate a relationship um, with China for anybody, let, let alone. Uh, the Australian government, but I mean, you know, uh, you know, when the jet chat touches down in Beijing, I just hope the Australian delegation are aware of, you know, a the the, the these extraordinary ambiguities and also the um, extraordinary internal tensions. And it's it, as we're discovering in North Africa and certainly discovered in Egypt, actually for Western powers, uh, it makes much more sense in the end to stand up for what you've always believed in rather than temporize. I mean, Chinese citizens respect that. And they will, one way or another, the news gets through. And there will be successors to this communist regime. And they will always remember the fact 
that actually the Australians are on the right side of history. Sorry to sound a bit portentous, but you know, it's what I think. <laughs> well, it's going to be, it is going to be a fascinating week uh, and, and months certainly ahead. Uh, Will Hutton, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those questions.